title of my talk is How I Stumbled Upon the Truth at the Margins. And uh, the first time I ever went to South Africa, I was happy to come home alive. For those of you who are familiar uh, with recent South African politics and history, what probably comes to mind is the successful transition from apartheid, from white minority rule, racist rule, uh, to democracy in 1994. Um, most of you certainly have heard of and are familiar with the story of Nelson Mandela. Maybe you've seen the movie Invictus that portrays uh, you know, happy coming together in South African history. Uh, but South Africa, since becoming democratic in 1994, is actually one of the most violent and unequal countries in the world. It, in fact, now tops all countries in the world for gap between rich and poor. And the levels of urban violence, murder per capita, are absolutely through the roof. And traveling uh, in South Africa for the first time in 2004, one thing that struck me was that when you're driving in most parts of South Africa, especially at night, you don't stop at a stop sign. You slow down 50 feet in front of the stop sign, scan the area ahead of you for danger, and then accelerate through the stop sign uh, to protect against carjackers. Carjacking is an extremely widespread phenomenon in South Africa. And many times they won't just take somebody's car, but they'll also take their life at the same time. And uh, when I visited South Africa this time, in 2004, I was hosted uh, very graciously by some members of my extended family who live in the township of Mabopane, which is near Pretoria, the capital. And uh, I think that the time that I feared most for my life ever was one time coming home from Pretoria in the car with my host. Coming off the highway, we were followed uh, by a car that trailed us very closely, followed us through uh, the various streets and all the way to the street on which my host lived. And it was completely dark. There was dead silence. There wasn't a soul out at that time. It was just us in this car behind us. And as we were coming to uh, my host's house, uh, one of us was going to have to get out of the car to open the gate, which is when you're most vulnerable to carjacking. And anyone in South Africa who can afford one lives in a house surrounded by a gate. Uh, so we thought, this is it. And then, just as we were pulling into the driveway, this car that had been trailing us the whole way inexplicably switched its lights off and drove off. And this actually happened quite near to a police station. And I asked my host, you know, why do you have to be so afraid for your life when the police are right there? And she said, well, here where we live, the police are more often part of the problem than part of the solution. Uh, so I was incredibly intrigued by these different uh, dynamics within South Africa, especially at that time, 10 years after the fall of apartheid. And so I decided to make that the focus of my doctoral research for my PhD in political science. Uh, and then I returned to South Africa in 2009 to do my field research. And the thing about doing research about urban violence in a country that leads the world in urban violence is that you really want to take care that you don't become a victim of that urban violence while you're busy studying it. Uh, and so I took every precaution that I could to make sure that I would be safe. And my doctoral supervisor got in touch with someone he knew, a researcher at a think tank in Pretoria, in the capital, a think tank that specializes in studying security, put me in touch with that researcher. And uh, that think tank was incredibly gracious. And so I would come into that think tank, which itself was located in a gated compound, essentially, as virtually all South African businesses are. Again, if they can afford it, they'll have some measure of security. And the more security you can afford, the more security you pay for. Uh, and so this uh, think tank was located in this compound. And when it was time for me to go have lunch, uh, upon the recommendation of the people at the think tank, I would take a cab from the think tank 
100 meters away to the shopping mall, go in there and get some lunch because uh, you're at such a high risk of being robbed at gunpoint virtually at any time of day or night in South Africa, in, in most parts of the country, that people considered it safe, safer for me just to take that cab to go get lunch. Uh, so I was living in that way for a while, in this, working in this air-conditioned think tank, uh, and then in the evenings, I would go home to this uh, youth hostel, a backpacker's hostel in another part of Pretoria where I was staying. And if you're familiar with backpacker's hostels in parts of Africa, you'll know that uh, they really cater almost exclusively to travelers from the West, the overwhelming majority of whom are white. And it's very rare that you actually meet uh, African people in uh, an African hostel, much less black African people uh, as there were uh, at this hostel. So I became uh, friends with some of these people. And the way that that happened was that I came home one time, uh, or I came back to the hostel, I should say, but it kind of felt like home. And I noticed that one of these gentlemen was sitting under a tree reading the newly released biography of the uh, former chief of the armed wing of the African National Congress, Chris Hani. And the book had just come out. Chris Hani is a tremendous figure in South African history. At the time of his murder in April 1993, just a year before South Africa's first free and fair elections, Chris Hani was second in popularity among the African National Congress leadership, second only to Nelson Mandela. And his murder uh, remains a turning point in South African history, just like the murder of JFK or Martin Luther King is such a huge turning point in US history. And so it just so happened that an hour earlier, I had bought the same newly released book about Chris Hani at the bookstore in the shopping mall. Uh, so I approached this gentleman and I said, hey, I just got that book too, what do you think? We got to talking and uh, we became good friends, he and, and his other friends who were there. And so I would come home from the think tank, meet my new friends. We shared food, we shared drink. Uh, we got along very well. And we became uh, closer over these few days. And gradually, uh, one, one evening, I was sitting with one of my new friends uh, and we, we were talking about our lives. I, I told her, we, we were exchanging stories. I told her the story of how uh, I had lost my mother to cancer just a year and a half earlier. And she told me the story of losing her brother to AIDS right around that same time. So through that exchange of experiences, we became very close. And she said, listen, if you're really serious about studying urban violence in our country, you really need to meet my brother. And she said her brother uh, was a former regional commander of Umkonto We Sizwe, of the armed wing of the African National Congress, uh, which means a spear of the nation in Isikosa. And uh, so she said, look, this, my brother was a, a, a high-ranking member of Umkonto We Sizwe. He was uh, closely affiliated with Chris Hani, and he has some stories that he can tell you. He has some knowledge he can share with you that you're not going to get anywhere else for sure. And so if you're interested, I can arrange for you to go and talk to him. I think you guys might get along. And the thing about Africans, as you may or may not know, Africans play for keeps when they make friends. So this invitation was real. And I had a decision to make now. Am I going to take this invitation or not? And the thing is that uh, my we were in Pretoria, the capital right around here. And my friend's brother lived in Umtata all the way down there. So that's a 14 hour drive. And it just meant if I was gonna take up this invitation, I was gonna have to scrap my existing plan. I was gonna have to uh, leave the think tank and go to a completely different part of the country. And I thought about it and I said, yeah, absolutely, I'll do it. So the next day, we started driving, 
And it really took us more like two days to get all the way to Umtata in the Eastern Cape province. And uh, the Eastern Cape province is one of the most beautiful places in the world. Uh, here, it, it's actually right on the Indian Ocean. And so uh, here you see the kind of uh, just very serene, overcast, lush beauty of that region. We drove down there. And when we arrived, uh, my friend's brother was waiting to meet me. He was uh, in his garage. The garage door was open. He and some friends were sitting on plastic chairs. They had food. They had drink. They told me to sit down. They asked me what kind of food I like. Uh, he sent some of his affiliates to go buy some chicken. And they grilled it right on the spot. And I sat with them for eight hours, from 2 p.m. till about 10 p.m. And by that night, I had essentially my dissertation in a nutshell. And uh, this gentleman said, look, while you're in town with us, you're going to be my guest. You're going to stay in my house. And so for someone who was afraid for his safety, and I should mention in, in Umtata, for the two months that I was there, I, I might have seen two or three other white people that whole time. Uh, so I definitely stood out in Umtata, and if you wanted to follow my movements over the course of several days and see what I was up to and uh, try something, that wouldn't have been too hard. Uh, but now I was living under the roof of a former regional commander of the armed wing of the African National Congress, and he was known around the neighborhood. He wasn't someone to mess with. So I was his guest, and this was as, as safe as I could possibly hope to be while doing my research. And so... This gentleman, whom everyone referred to simply as the commander, uh, arranged for me to speak to, uh, first to himself, but then also to interview many of his friends and affiliates who had also been uh, members of the ANC's armed wing and who had also participated in the armed struggle against apartheid throughout the 1980s and into the early 1990s. And so this really formed the basis of my research at that time. And what emerged from there uh, were these histories of exclusion, histories of marginalization. Uh, many of these gentlemen who had fought for freedom and expected to take a central role in building the new democratic South Africa after apartheid had fallen, uh, actually ended up uh, being shunted aside. And one of the stories that illustrates this best uh, that I was told uh, by a number of them was that in 1994, a month before the first free and fair elections in which Nelson Mandela was elected uh, in April 1994, a month prior, they had assembled at a military base in, near Pretoria where they were going to be integrated into the new security forces of South Africa. And so they came in good faith expecting to play a role in these new democratic institutions of the state, and instead what happened was uh, that when they arrived, they were disarmed, but they were being guarded by heavily armed soldiers from the apartheid military uh, who uh, treated them very poorly, abused them, and killed a number of them who disappeared without a trace and were never heard from again. Uh, and so based on this experience, most of these uh, now ex guerrillas simply fled. They demobilized and they played no further role in uh, the transition, and they were never integrated into uh, the new security forces as they had hoped and expected to be. And so from this research, for me, emerged a picture uh, of this marginalization of specifically uh, combatants from the armed wing of the Af African National Congress from Umkonto We Sizwe who uh, were excluded from the security forces at a critical moment in South African history uh, in a process that contributed to the eventual uh, insecurity and widespread violence that has characterized daily life in South Africa since the time of the transition. And so uh, this is me in the Eastern Cape province while I was undertaking uh, this research and being so generously hosted. Uh, but the, uh, 
uh, take-home points relating to this research and these findings have to do with the fact that the truth, which as I say, I stumbled upon, uh, the truth is often located at the margins. The truth is often located in these hidden histories among people who have been marginalized during great historical political processes and whose stories then in turn were marginalized in the telling of those processes and of those histories afterward. So that when it comes to South Africa, when it comes to many other countries that have experienced civil war, that have experienced transitions from authoritarianism to democracy, and that continue also to experience high levels of violence after that transition, uh, the, the histories that we're most familiar with are almost always those that originate with the leadership, with the elites. It's their experiences, their histories, that end up shaping the narratives that we hear, that we receive. And in order to really go beyond that, look beyond, uh, it takes that leap of faith. It takes that leap of faith to go seek out these hidden histories uh, and to relinquish all preconceived notions and to simply uh, be prepared really for the unprepared. Be prepared for uh, these experiences which we could never anticipate, which we could never plan for departing from the beaten path uh, in order to go to the margins and to find the truth. And it takes that leap of faith that uh, really, I think, is encapsulated by this uh, quote from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, who said that faith is taking the first step even when you can't see the whole staircase. Uh, so we need to have that faith to go to the margins, and the way to get there also is through those human connections that we establish, those human connections that we can build through telling our stories to each other. And these connections bring us to a place that I believe is beyond local and foreigner, beyond black and white. It's a common human place, and it's from that place that we can begin to unearth the truth that lies at the margins. Thank you very much.